Welcome, welcome everybody. We're gonna give everybody some time to get logged in here. So we're gonna probably start at just about two minutes after. Thanks for joining us on your Friday. Um, if you guys have questions uh, during the webinar, uh, please go ahead and put them into Q&A versus chat. It's just a little bit easier for us to keep track of them, keep track of them there. Um, I will drop links to the previous day's chats uh, here in a bit, and then I'll also drop them at the end um, so you can review the talks that have already been given this week. We'll get started in about another minute here. Just want to make sure we give people time to, to join. All right, uh, I'm going to kick it over to Chris in just a second. Um, a reminder, this is Spectre Ops webinar week. We've been hearing for each of the three teams at Spectre Ops, uh, the adversary simulation team, the adversary detection, and the adversary resilience teams. Uh, if you missed any of the previous talks, again, I'll drop links here and you can uh, watch the recordings. Uh, Chris is going to talk about report team project management and report construction. Um, and he is also from the adversary simulation team. Uh, Chris, over to you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. I think it's zoom out of the way. All right, yeah, so as uh, Justin said, my name is Chris from Adelina. I'm a managing consultant here at Spectre Ops and do work on the adversary simulation side. So if you're a part of any of the webinars or like Will's webinar yesterday, uh, you know, on the AdSim side, you know, we work on mostly like the red teams, penetration testing and so forth. Uh, so today, uh, if you've been joining in any of the previous webinars, you know, you heard from like the detection team, the simulation team, you heard about, you know, some of like the research uh, and you know, some of the testing that we do. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how to we bring all that together for reporting and also just managing our our projects as we go forward, you know, with a company that is largely made up of remote employees. So a quick agenda for us today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the problems that you can encounter when you're trying to manage a remote team uh, and then start getting into how best to, you know, uh, lead a remote team, uh, address some of the common problems, and then actually, you know, bring it all together for, uh, you know, like a killer report at the end. So to get started, you know, projects are basically controlled chaos. You know, kind of like the title says, much like this slide, there's a lot going on. Uh, when you're looking at how, at, you know, us as individuals like to manage our files, uh, you know, keep notes, there's all sorts of different services that everyone can use. Uh, and one of the first problems you encounter with a remote team is if everyone is using a disparate system to manage their files or you know, they prefer to sync things a different way. Uh, you end up with files kind of spread out everywhere and not everything gets synced to one location where the team can access it. This can work and often, you know, teams can kind of limp along with, uh, you know, using a bunch of different systems or changing it up on a per project basis. But what ends up happening is that if you don't have a strict and blessed process in place, you end up actually putting a lot of data at risk. You know, some of this data can just evade cleanup. Uh, so you end up with like notes or evidence files, perhaps like from an assessment that still gets left on some file share somewhere and never gets cleaned up. Uh, so you end up creating more risk for yourself as well as a headache when it comes to reporting time. If you're not, you know, kind of all focused on one, you know, one mission and using like one blessed process. And that's going to be sort of a through line through the rest of uh, our, our discussion today. 
So let's look at some of the, you know, the basic building blocks that you need to follow, uh, you know, to lead a, you know, a successful remote team. The first one is communication. There's really no faster way to sync a project than ignoring, you know, setting consistent expectations and using reliable communication methods. And you're going to hear me talk about setting expectations a lot. I recommend against turning that into a drinking game because it could get dangerous. We're going to talk about expectations quite a bit. The other thing is that this is crucial for just eliminating duplication of effort, uh, as well as other potentially damaging things like someone going out of scope, running afoul of like operational security considerations, uh, and other things. So you want to make sure everyone's staying in communication and has you know understanding of all the expectations for that project. The other thing, as we mentioned uh, in that first slide, is organizing files. So you want to have files that are properly named, follow a certain like naming convention, are organized in a predictable and expected way so that anyone on the team, if they want to get a hold of a particular log file, they know exactly where to look and they'll be able to find that log file. If it's not there, they know it doesn't exist or hasn't been synced uh, and they can go get it or work with the team to find it. Organization becomes key to making it you know, efficient for everyone to be able to find whatever it is they need, what, you know, wherever the team has it. Next, we have you know just like project tracking. Uh, this works into communication, uh, just coordinating that work, uh, eliminating duplication of effort, making sure that everyone is aware of where the project is on the timeline, what needs to be done, the you know the progress on each objective, so that at any point in time, anyone can have a good understanding of where they are in the project. Uh, when you you're a remote team member, you don't always have direct access to that information. And then finally, report documents. You know, working on making sure you have what you need to deliver that uh, you know final report is key. You know, right from the beginning, you want to have like, you know templates ready. You want to start drafting things. You want to keep notes as you go. And we'll talk more about this as as we get into uh, you know some details here in the future slides. Again, let's talk about just some of the considerations for a remote team. So one of the key things that, you know, like I definitely feel as, as someone who, who leads, you know, some of our remote teams and remote projects is that one of the primary considerations you need to have, uh, or one of the things you need to really understand is that team members are all individuals. So, you know, all of us have our own daily routines. Uh, you know, we, you know, much like we already talked, like we have our own feelings on like what kind of tech setter we want to use, how we like to keep our notes, how we like to organize things how we like to communicate. And this comes into play a lot when, uh, especially for a team lead, which to divert for a moment, uh, while you know, every company can, can do this a little bit differently, you know, here at SpectreOps at least, we always have at least two team members on every project. And one of those team members will be assigned as the assessment lead. That person ends up with a, a little bit of uh, you know, extra responsibility in that you know, they are you know, like that main point of contact for the project. They're the ones that are tracking that uh, and kind of have that final say on how like, tasks are outlined. So when that assessment lead is trying to work with their team, uh, which often are remote and perhaps across the country from them, one of the things they need to consider is just how their team members are going to prefer to work. Uh, you know, for some folks, you can give them a very general task, like go escalate privileges, go get DA, and they'll go silent for several hours, autumn, and then just automatically check back in uh, with their progress, you know, to let you know that it was done or that they've hit some kind of blocker. While other folks uh, work much better if they can bounce ideas off of people, uh, or they might require a little bit more direction, like they would like you to actually give them more explicit details on what you want them to do. Being able to understand and read people to understand like, what they need uh, to get the task done is, is a key uh, skill for an assessment lead to be able to build and grow. Uh, so that they can task things out to the team and they'll actually get done uh, and, and people don't end up just feeling frustrated like they don't have enough information. The next thing is setting clear expectations for the team. Uh, making sure that, the, that the, everyone on the team understands you know, the concrete expectations that they have. We'll talk about this more uh, in a future slide, but for now just remember that without concrete expectations, the lead and all the team members have no way of really gauging how the project is going. 
Uh, no one can really know, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing if the expectations are unclear or not written down somewhere. And finally, and this one is one of the trickiest things. I have you know, here on the slide written as like over communication is greater than withdrawal, uh, which is just a, a simplification of the idea that we all kind of perhaps fear becoming a micromanager. Uh, it's definitely something that you know, we've encountered with just like working with leaders at Specter Ops. One of the first things that often comes up is I don't want to bug people too much. I don't want to check in so frequently. It feels like I'm micromanaging someone. But really, when you're talking about working on a remote team, you need to resist that urge as much as possible. Don't withdraw, especially just like superficially, because you feel like, ah, I already talked to them like an hour ago. I don't want to check in again and keep bugging someone. Staying in contact is really important. And sometimes the lead just has to check in frequently and understand. Uh, and sometimes this is a cost that is a bit more of an upfront one-time cost. As you know, your leads work with team members more frequently, uh, eventually they'll have a better understanding of how that person you know, works best. And they'll be able to identify those folks that perhaps you know, can step away uh, you know, and be left alone for several hours and they know they're getting their work done versus the people who, uh, you know, flourish when they're you know, having more like direct communication with their lead. So to get into some of the daily tasks, one being just daily communication. So here at Specter Ops, uh, we make use of daily stand-up calls as well as something you know, we just call daily status reports. These are the bare minimum communication that we have for any given project on any given day. So the daily stand-up calls, these are usually something at the start of the day, maybe they're a little bit later in the morning, depending on how people want to get going, uh, you know, when they want to start their day, the execution windows for that, that particular project. But they're usually like half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, where the team is just going to talk about like what the plans are for that day, where they are in the project, what status was, you know, what progress was made the day before, uh, and so forth, and kind of just set the tone for the rest of the day. Uh, then you have the end of the day status reports. You know, this is something that the lead will usually peel off and maybe start doing around like 4 p.m. on an average workday. Uh, just looking at get, collecting the status from all the team members of what have you accomplished today? Where are we at with these different tasks? Uh, and then this actually gets assembled into a report. So that's, this is the daily status report or DSR that, that we maintain for all of our projects. And these end up actually being a document of what happened on each day of every day of any given project. So we can look back and we can see, all right, you know, on April 10th, we accomplished this. Uh, and so we can then pick up from there, you know, on Monday and move on. So like I said, this is the bare minimum of level of communication. Uh, anything less than this would be, you know, really just approaching negligence as far as like actually being able to, uh, you know, keep tabs on a remote team. So the next level would be real-time communication. I would say that you know, effective, effective remote teams leverage real-time communication channels. Text chat is great. We all use it every day. Uh, but one of the big drawbacks of it is that you know, typing something out takes time. And you're more likely to have someone if they have a technical question or some sort of you know, larger issue they're trying to figure out, that if they have to sit there and type out a whole bunch of context and textual inf you know, uh, contextual information, they might just decide, I'll just keep working on it. I'm not going to bother the team with it. The other thing is that when you have text chat, uh, text chat, you know, it works different than like a real time communicate, you know, a real time like conversation you're having, like say like in an office. So what we actually have noticed sometimes happens uh, at Specter Ops is because we do have a couple of offices and occasionally, uh, you know, we are able to work in like a co-located area, you know, uh, as a co-located team. Sometimes we'll have like say two people that are working in our, in our Seattle office together, and then someone who is remote. What can happen is that you end up with those two people in the office. One of them like raises, you know, kind of bounces an idea off the other person that gets a conversation going. They start figuring something out and then it just begins to snowball where like they have a breakthrough and they start working on something. Meanwhile, an hour goes by and that third person is just totally oblivious to anything going on. Uh, and then the other two people eventually realize, oh, we've left that person totally out of the loop here. We need to catch them up on what just happened. That just takes time. It's inefficient. That third person, it doesn't feel good for them. They were just like totally left out of this cool breakthrough. Uh, so 
doing what you can to have a real time like communication channel is definitely worth it. Uh, and you'll, you'll find that it pays dividends over the course of, over the course of a project, especially as you're dealing with more technical obstacles. Now, of course, the one thing that comes up when you're talking about a real time communication with a remote team is that it feels really restrictive and kind of scary. Like the idea of like, I'm going to be on a phone call for eight hours. I want to listen to music or, or, you know, that just people don't necessarily like that idea. It's a lot better than you think. Uh, one of the key things to making it work is make sure you have a routine uh, and, set, and set expectations for what that call is going to be. So if you want to say, start your day with your daily status and then just keep that call going, feel free to set a routine so that they know that, hey, at the start of this call, you're kind of like you're in a meeting. We expect you to be here and responsive for the first half an hour. We're going to talk about our daily status, task things, uh, and, and then move forward with our day. At that point, you can go listen to music, get comfortable, chill out, go on mute. You can walk away. No, you don't have to check in with everyone. Let them know that you're coming or going. It's just like you're in an office. When you're in an office, you understand your coworker might be listening to music, have headphones on, might not be at their desk. You apply that to your call. Uh, and as people get comfortable with this, which really that's the goal, getting comfortable with it, that facilitates the flow of communication uh, and the flow of conversation and ideas where the people who want to bounce ideas can unmute themselves and like just throw out ideas, uh, you know, random thoughts like, hey, I just saw this interesting thing. Uh, and what we find, like, for example, I have a screenshot here kind of as, as proof that, you know, recently on, on an assessment, uh, we had a, an eight and, a, eight and a half hour Slack call, one that, you know, lasted the entire day. It was uninterrupted by other meetings. And we had a lot done that day. Uh, when you're digging into something highly technical where like one person's digging into documentation in one area of the network and someone else is looking at some other thing, you can start connecting dots that might otherwise go unnoticed. Like, oh, hey, I'm actually looking at that thing that you're reading the documentation on. Let's talk about it. And you can start having some breakthroughs and interesting ideas. So let's talk about those expectations we've already alluded to several times. So all of this really only works if you have communicated concrete expectations. One of the key things, especially when you're talking about like real-time communication, is setting a, a concrete expectation for working hours. So we're probably all used to the idea of just having like execution hours. Like, hey, uh, the client only wants us to execute between nine and five Pacific. Great. But what happens if you have people who are on East Coast, Central, Mountain Time, um, or perhaps, you know, for a while we actually had, uh, you know, one of our employees was, uh, was stationed over in Germany is so you have these wildly different time zones and everyone's trying to work together. So you want to set the expectation that if everyone should be working from nine to five Pacific, that they know that. So they change their daily routine. So they have those working hours rather than they show up what seems like three hours late because they're in a different time zone. If you are going to let everyone just work, whatever their daily, you know, whatever they feel like, it doesn't matter. Hey, just work your normal work day. Make sure the team understands that so that there's less frustration when someone needs to get a hold of someone they have an understanding like, oh, well, that person actually ended work an hour ago. So I'll, I'll catch up with them in the morning so that everyone understands what the plan is, what hours they'll be working together versus when they might be on their own and so forth. And this really extends to every other part of the assessment, what the objectives are. Uh, expectations for like operational security, like should they be really focused on evading, you know, detection? Uh, does that really matter? Uh, should they be, you know, touching certain hosts? Are there, you know, scoping expectations that need to be followed? Uh, when should they be checking with the assessment lead before they do something and or versus what are they just allowed to do without approval? Uh, anything that you would hope that someone would do needs to be, you know, written down. Uh, and, and explained. Don't just assume anything that just because you had a kickoff call where it was mentioned, hey, do this thing on this assessment. Especially if you have an assessment that's like five or six weeks long, people are going to forget. Uh, have it written down where they can actually go back and, and uh, you know, review it. So with communication covered, let's talk about addressing some of those common problems uh, that, we, that we mentioned earlier. First one, just being organizing your files. One of the key things here, uh, we mentioned with that very first slide, is everyone has their own, you know, considerations, their own like preferences when they, you know, how they want to organize their files or how they take their screenshots. 
we want to make sure that everyone is thinking kind of outside themselves and they're organizing as a team. This is going to increase efficiency later on. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, one of the key things here is I want, like as, as a lead and as a manager, I want everyone on the team to be able to uh, at, find a log file that they need at any given time or a screenshot that they're looking for at any given time. They should be able to go into the project, you know, the project folder and be able to know exactly where they will find that screenshot. Uh, and what it will look like. And so that if it's not there, they know it just doesn't exist and they should go get it. So this will help out a lot uh, in the reporting phase, of course, uh, but it also helps just as you're going through the assessment, knowing like, hey, we did gather that evidence after all, uh, or we, we didn't get that screenshot, we should go back and get it. And one of the things where it really pays off in the reporting phase is I, I alluded to earlier having like a proper naming convention. Uh, so like here at SpectreOps, we actually have a, a naming scheme for our screenshots and evidence files, which we'll talk a little bit more um, in the coming slides. But where this comes into play is you want to be thinking about this uh, when everyone has different screenshotting software. Like, you know, if you're using a Mac, your screenshots are all by default, just like screenshot some date at some time dot PNG. That's not really helpful uh, if all your screenshots are just a bunch of timestamps. Uh, you end up squinting at a bunch of thumbnails or opening up a bunch of, of uh, like preview windows to see which screenshot is the one you're looking for. And the same thing applies to logs. Like if you have multiple redirectors or multiple like phishing sites, uh, you, you end up with several access.log files. How do you know which one of them is the one for that server? Making sure everything is organized in a predictable way uh, is, is key to making sure everything runs efficiently. Otherwise you end up, you know, a red team ends up just like bleeding efficiency uh, with you know lost time just trying to hunt for a file. So one of the ways that you know SpectreOps addresses this is we have a standard uh, subfolder like naming scheme, uh, and everyone understands like where files go. So under all of our project folders, uh, and these are folders that end up that are shared with the entire project team, uh, we have these these folders here. I'm not going to go over each and every single one of them, um, but just if you look at this, know that each one has its own purpose. This is documented and everyone understands that if you want to find the statement of work or rules of engagement document, you go to the admin folder. That's where like the daily status report lives. It, it all goes in there. If you have like a C2 profile for Cobalt Strike or anything that is related to infrastructure, that would go in the infrastructure folder. Uh, so everything ends up in a very predictable location. So at any given time, someone needs to go grab it. They know right where it is. Uh, screenshots and targets are two interesting ones. Uh, so targets will actually put a, a subfolder below targets for every uh, specific like host that we're looking at. It doesn't have to be every single one, uh, but this really helps when later on, if you were very, very focused on one you know, particular host or you know, slash server uh, for an objective because of some files you found on it, having all of your like logs and interesting data collected for that host under a host folder really helps to go be able to go back to that one spot and reference it later on. Same thing with screenshots. Uh, like I mentioned, we have that formalized name for screenshots, making sure that um, screenshots are all in the screenshots folder and they're, they're named properly really helps just speed things up when, you know, when it comes time for reporting time or just validating you have that evidence collected. So with each one of these problems, we'll talk a little bit about how you might automate things. So in this case, automation is actually pretty easy. Uh, for example, with when you're looking at templates, uh, you know, like templates of blank folders, you can just have a template folder that you copy and paste into your project uh, directory whenever you need it. It's also pretty easy to create like a bash script that would go through and create all those folders for you as you know, whenever you set up like this is what folder structure we want to use. Uh, likewise, if you're looking at, for example, like screenshots. So uh, at SpectreOps, we use a screenshot format of a UTC timestamp which will go with like year, month, day, underscore, the hour and minute, underscore, the target or like whatever application that screenshot uh, is related to, uh, underscore some description. So we like this because then when you go into that screenshots folder, you can see, okay, on this day, we took these screenshots. Uh, I'm looking for, you know, something we did yesterday on the ninth uh, for this particular domain controller. Uh, and you can go and say, okay, yep, Here's all the screenshots from the ninth. There's the domain controller's name, three screenshots for that domain controller, and here's the descriptions and very easily uh, you know, key in on which, which screenshot you're looking for. 
to make it easy, so you're not constantly renaming things, uh, you can set up like a, a script. So in this case, uh, this is like a Mac OS automator, you know, like service script with, that runs a shell script that when you hit a certain key binding, it pops up a little window, asks you to name your screenshot. You take your screenshot and it automatically creates that properly, you know, formatted screenshot name and saves it in this case, like a, a screenshots folder on the desktop. So that then the operator can run this, have their screenshots all properly named, and then they can go through them later and decide maybe like which ones they want to sync up or, you know, which screenshot they like best. So then infrastructure. So managing infrastructure, I, I like to think of it as, you know, you need to be a good shepherd for all your sheep. You have all these, you know, domain names and IP addresses, cloud assets that are all just kind of out there uh, like, like your sheep. And they tend to wander off if you're not keeping a careful eye on them especially cloud assets. They just get forgotten about, they don't get torn down. Uh, and one of the key things here, the, or really the key problem is that your project depends on these. I mean, this is your infrastructure. Uh, so you wanna keep an eye on all of it. And where this really comes into, you know, into play in a big way on a project is just deconfliction requests. You want to be able to very quickly tell a client if they come to you and say, hey, uh, we've detected like a phishing campaign from, from this IP address, or we have, notice, you know, some malicious activity uh, related to this domain name. Is this you? Uh, anyone on the team, if the lead is unavailable or, uh, you know, maybe the whole team is, is unavailable for some reason, so they have to get a hold of, like, a, a manager at SpectreOps, uh, you know, where we want them to be able to easily go in and say, no, that is not our IP address, uh, so that anyone can very swiftly deconflict that, uh, that request from the blue team. Uh, and then also we have, you know, effects that outlast the project, like domain names, they stick around. Like you, you buy a domain name, you have it at least for a year. So understanding like what's going on with that domain name uh, is important. Sometimes you want to be able to reuse them for a project, but you probably don't want to reuse it for the same client. Sometimes you want to be able to market domain as just like burned, like, Hey, this is up in virus total. Don't even try to use this. It's just going to be blocked as spam uh, and so on. So finding some way to track all that information is is one of the big problems when it comes to just managing projects as a whole, whether really rather remote or uh, if you're all in an office. And the real trick is making sure that this is done consistently across the entire team. So when you're looking at like standards for this, one, you, you have to just have to find a solution that you can stick with. What solution that is, is really up to you. Uh, there's lots of ways you might do this. Uh, you know, I've seen teams do this with just like a shared spreadsheet. It works, uh, you know, same like a wiki page. It works, except that uh, the one thing to keep in mind is that anytime you have a solution like that, where a uh, where humans are heavily involved in it, it can it, it will probably eventually fail you, uh, just because people are forgetful. They forget to at the end of an assessment go and mark a domain as as no longer in use. Uh, it it starts to plant that seed. Uh, of doubt within the team. So that really, while it feels like you have this all set up and managed and it's being, you know, you have this like checkout spreadsheet where everyone can mark if they're using a domain or not. It ends up to just a lot of people going to like a Slack channel and pinging everyone and being like, is anyone using this domain name? I just want to double check, et cetera, et cetera. You want people to be able to rely on the solution to know like, no, this data is accurate. And again, expectations. So once you have that solution, making sure that everyone understands how it should be used. So if you're gonna use a wiki to track your infrastructure, make sure that it's, there's a clear written down expectation that like the assessment lead needs to go in and create the, you know, that wiki page to track that project's you know, infrastructure at the start of the assessment uh, so that everyone knows that's where you're gonna find all the infrastructure and it's going to be there at the start of every project and so on. And again, it's really uh, important you commit to this as a team. Uh, you know, so at, at SpectreOps, we use a tool called Ghostwriter. It's a, it's a homegrown, you know, in-house developed tool. Uh, we did release it as, as an open source project. Uh, like the screenshot here is, is, a, is a snippet from, from that UI that tracks like all of our domain names. So it lets you know like how old the domain is, when we bought it, is it set up to auto renew, gives you all the data there. 
uh, that, you know, otherwise you might have to go to the registrar to get and lets you know, like, hey, is this burned? Is it a healthy domain? Can I use it? Is it checked out? What projects has it been used on? You know, which, which clients and so forth. So all the information is there for anyone on the team to be able to access at a moment's notice. So to give an example of automation, one of the key things here, like I mentioned, you, you want to try to remove human involvement as much as possible you know, in the areas where a human forgetting something might cause you know, the, the reliability of that system to break down. So let the computer handle things like releasing a domain back into like your, your domain pool at the end of a project, things like that. Uh, and one good example uh, is like, using a, a script in the APIs provided by most cloud providers to monitor your cloud assets. So if you wanna make sure that you're not bleeding out five plus dollars a month on some forgotten EC2 instance or forgotten DigitalOcean droplet, and also that those systems are torn down so they're not potentially creating some risk for you or leaking data or anything like that, uh, you wanna make sure they're torn down at the end of a project. That's one of the things that I think is, you know, is most forgotten uh, at the end of, of any project is like, oh yeah, we need to go tear down all those digital ocean droplets we spun up. So having something uh, like Ghostwriter has a background task that checks daily for using APIs, like checks the cloud, like, hey, what systems do we have up and running? It gets back the statuses of all those systems. It checks to see how, uh, if any of those are related to a project, if it is related to a, a an ended completed project, it sends out a notification to that team to say, hey, you still have these servers up and running in AWS, you should go tear them down. Uh, so anything there where you can kind of, you know, smooth out that workflow to remind people like, hey, you still have these cloud assets up, so you're not finding them like seven months later and trying to chase down who owns them and why are they still up. So now let's talk about activity logs. This is often a controversial topic uh, and a lot of people have different thoughts on it. At Spectre Ops, uh, we feel that activity logging is one of the most important things that we do during a project. This is, when I say activity logging, I don't necessarily just mean like tool logging. I mean taking a moment out of your time when you're running a command to go in and actually log what you just did. Uh, this is important because we need to be able to answer questions. Like I said, you know, with infrastructure, if a blue team comes to us and says, hey, is this your IP? We wanna be able to say yes or no. Same thing if they come to us and say like, hey, we're seeing something weird with this user account. Uh, is this related to the testing? We want to be able to say, going looking at the activity logs, no, we've never used that account. That's not us. Uh, or we do have that account, but here's what we're doing with it, which doesn't quite match with what you're saying you're seeing. Uh, so being able to give the blue teams that, again, swift deconfliction, uh, and, you know, and context around what we're doing. So rather than just like, yeah, we did compromise that account, so maybe it's the test, we can say definitively, here's what we did with it and when, uh, and so they can try to match that up with like the alert they're seeing. Likewise, you're tracking anything that's like a, a system modification, of, you know, a change to group membership in AD, anything like that, so that later on you can come back and revert those changes. The key thing here uh, and where some of the controversy comes in is just, well, I'm already logging all that with like Cobalt Strike Beacon logs and you know, I, I run Tmux logging and I, I have logs in all my terminals, so all that's being captured. But grepping through a bunch of logs is just inefficient. It's gonna, and the big thing is gonna lack the context around those commands. And you're, gonna, you're not gonna see why someone did something. And also, of course, those logging can fail. Uh, sometimes you, at the worst, you know, in the worst cases, uh, you realize that the logs that you need, for some reason that tool stopped logging or the log file got corrupted and now you're at a total loss of what was going on that day uh, or with that particular tool. So setting up a logging standard is really important. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, set those expectations. Uh, the, good, the rule that we follow with Spectrops is basically log anything that might trigger an incident or changes a config. So like lateral movements, you ran DC sync, there's some scanning activity, maybe you tried to log in as a user and that triggered sending an, uh, an MFA push. So maybe that user might report suspicious activity for their account. Uh, anything like that, we come in and log. And we have this uh, example here of this is how we log things. These are like the fields we track, uh, like the start time when you ran that command or, or did the thing. Uh, the end time, which is usually more like scanning activity, things that would be long running. 
like I ran Bloodhound, it took an hour. So you, you would log the start and end of that. The source, like where it was coming from, the, to what target, uh, the tool that you use, the user contacts you were running it within, uh, the command you ran, as well as a description of just what that command did uh, and the results. And then the comments field, this is maybe one of the most important ones, is just tracking context of like, why did you move to that, that host? Or why did you DC sync that user account? Uh, and then you're just logging any modifications that was made to those systems and who ran it. So at any time, anyone can come into one of our activity logs and see when something was run with what user accounts, for what reason, and by whom. And we're able to then you know, swiftly deconflict that. And that ability to be able to come in and look at those logs at any point in time and see this is the other reason that we say that you know, we need to log immediately. Uh, it's... Sometimes, you know, people want to, well, I'll keep a scratch pad and I'll come in and I'll fill it in later. That's difficult because in the time that it takes them to kind of like do that batching of like, well, I'll just write it down real quick and I'll come in and fill it in. You might have a deconfliction request comes in. And the worst thing that might happen is someone says like, hey, is this you? You look at the activity log and you say, no, that's not us. We didn't do that. But then an hour later, someone comes in and, and fills in a bunch of missing logs. And it turns out that was their activity. And now you have to go back to the client and say, like, actually, that was us. Sorry about that. We want to avoid that as much as possible. <laughs> so when it comes to automation, I recommend starting small. There are things you can do to kind of automate this process, like filling in uh, the timestamps or things like that. Uh, one thing that I would recommend is, like, say you're using a, a Confluence Wiki page to track your your activity, use things like Confluence macros to give someone a shortcut to be able to automatically fill in like the timestamp, uh, things like that. Uh, perhaps like an autocomplete of, of previously entered like targets uh, and so forth. So in like this case, here's a Confluence macro that you could set up that would automatically drop in, uh, you know, the, the current uh, timestamp in the like uh, kind of like our SpectreOps standard timestamp format. You want to make sure you're, you're letting the computers do what computers do well without uh, automating too much of the human interaction so you don't lose that, that context around what was being done. So one of the final things to talk about like, you know, during an assessment is keeping notes. Um, I like to just remind everyone that everyone is a scribe. So everyone should be keeping notes. Uh, at no point on your team should someone be like, well, I'm not going to keep notes because I assume everyone else is doing it that often will lead to a situation where everyone assumes someone else was doing it. And so you don't really have any notes on like what you were all doing. And you know, you end up with no narrative at the end of your, your assessment. And you're kind of like trying to piece things back together from memory and your activity logs. These notes don't have to be fancy. Uh, I personally like just, I have a, a markdown, like a markdown note that I keep in like sublime text that I add to each day uh, with the goal of just building kind of a reference journal. Uh, dropping in, like really use this as a journal, uh, like record your thoughts. Like, did you see a user account you thought was interesting? We haven't had time to go investigate. You saw, you saw something weird with a web app, just make a note of it. Uh, so then later as you're reviewing those notes, you can say like, oh, you know what? I never did go back and do that. So if you have extra time, maybe at the end of the assessment, all objectives are done. The team's notes, these like reference journals can end up uh, giving you some direction on things. You might want to go back and tie up loose ends. Uh, and also, by the end of it, you end up with what might be usually a, a very good rough sketch of what your like attack path narrative might be for your report uh, that you can now use that to build off of without having to try to piece everything back together from memory and figure out how it should all be sorted. Uh, you've already done that work just naturally throughout the assessment. One of the key things that are one of like the big arguments against this that I hear is, you know, like recording takes too much time. You know, same thing with activity logging. Uh, it can be hard to, to make that brain switch of like going from I'm working on something technical to I need to go do some like light reporting. It's really not that hard. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. Uh, really, the one thing to think about is that if you can't write a short blurb explaining why you're doing something, why are you doing it? If you're just running a command because it feels like a thing to do, maybe you just don't do it. So that's often like for me personally, like a, a threshold that if I'm thinking about going to do something, if I can't write like a sentence on why I'm about to do it or why I did it, why it was interesting to me, I just don't even do it. So now as we're beginning to wrap up, get into the post-assessment work. 
So you get to like the final day or so of, of your execution window and you should have like this checklist. If you've been doing everything that, you know, like, like we do here at Spectre Ops, uh, you know, kind of like taking some of these recommendations and like applying them, you know, however you, however they work for like for your team, you'll have like, you know, daily status reports, your activity logs, an organized collection of project files. You'll have verified evidence that has a, a particular like naming scheme so people can identify what you know, each piece is. You have team notes so you can review uh, and then you can like discuss the narrative. So on the final day, what I, uh, you know, what I always recommend you know, for the teams at Spectre Ops and what we do is we'll go through, we look at our daily statuses, we know what happened on each day, we have our activity logs uh, and we'll sit down as a team and review each other's notes and just kind of walk through them and say, like, okay, here's what I have for that day. Here's kind of like the rough draft of the narrative of how I see things went for the past, you know, like four weeks. Uh, and we see if everyone agrees, like, is, uh, are there any missing, any missing pieces that someone has that the other members of the team don't, uh, because it's something they saw, uh, that the others didn't and so forth. And once the team determines like, okay, what we've just assembled feels like the complete narrative, you're, you're pretty good to begin, uh, to move on with reporting. That review of the narrative is also very important because it starts to give you the idea of what, what evidence you might need. So you can say like, okay, well, we did this. We're definitely going to want a log of that. Do we have the log somewhere? Uh, and go verify you have the logs. Do you have the screenshots you want for that? Uh, and making sure, again, going back to that organized project files, that you're able to very quickly say, okay, do we have that? Well, we did that on April 8th. Go back to screenshots. Look at April 8th. We have the screenshot verified. It's there. We can move on to the next thing. If you do all this, you're primed and ready to build a killer report. You basically now have like a Lego kit to build, to build that report. You have all the elements are there. Uh, you just have to put them together and whatever, you know, feels good for your final report. What feels good will be different for each team. Uh, but there's a few things that you can do to make sure that moves smoothly and also to keep things consistent, no matter who was on the team, no matter what project it is, that you know, if someone comes to your company or comes to your team and says, you know, do this test for us, they have an expectation of like what that report's going to look like. So, like if you have repeat customers year over year, or you have a referral, uh, they can be sure that they're going to get the same kind of report, the same quality that you know they, they are accustomed to, or they've been you know promised from like that referral. So the first thing you can do is maintain a template report. Uh, these, you know, we recommend templates for all your different types of assessments. So you're not trying to like remove things or move things around, uh, you know, on a per assessment basis, maintain a finding library. So all of your different like boilerplate findings that you're going to reuse over and over again, make sure they are recorded somewhere. So you have like a blessed already like QA'd and controlled and edited, like this is our standard finding for that thing. Same ways, uh, you know, same with the style guide. Make sure you have a style guide. This is the thing that just answers all of your reporting questions. Uh, like what sections should we have? Uh, how should things be formatted? Uh, what is the right color purple that Spectre Ops uses for like this heading in our report? All of those things get answered like in the Spectre Ops style guide. Uh, and we definitely encourage everyone to have one on hand because it even answers all those little questions like, well, you know, technical writing calls for, you know, always spelling out the first use of an acronym, but what acronyms might we just assume that someone reading the report should know? Like SMB, is SMB something we need to spell out on the first use or is like SMB and HTML and things like that, are those just acronyms that we can leave as, you know, um, same thing with like, what do we capitalize? Do we capitalize domain controller? Um, yes or no. Uh, making sure that all those little things are answered in the style guide and you can build upon it. It doesn't have to all be at once. Uh, but, you know, as people have questions, uh, you put it in your style guide. And this is huge for helping onboarding new team members later. Uh, so you can give them the style guide and say, this is how we write a report and kind of answers all of their questions. Uh, if a style guide is a new thing to you, I, Bishop, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Bishop Fox actually offers a pretty decent one to get you started. It's just uh, if you search for a Bishop Fox cybersecurity style guide, uh, they have one out there that will, you know, kind of you can use as a seed to get started. The next thing that we strongly recommend is just checking your work. Uh, implement a quality assurance process. The QA process puts several eyes on your report, keeps everyone on the same page, uh, and delivers a consistent report no matter who wrote it. 
So no matter what permutation of team members you have, uh, who the assessment lead was, et cetera, et cetera, you have a, you know, whatever like the specter ops report is, is what comes out of this process for specter ops. You know, and the same thing for, for your team. Uh, the process that we like to follow, uh, and I would recommend, you know, considering if, if you don't already have one is, uh, we have a, a three phase process. Uh, so what we just call it QA1 would be the assessment team checks each other's works. So this is, uh, you know, at SpectreOps, we usually have like maybe one person on the team is really like assigned to reporting, uh, you know, following the assessment. And that person will be, you know, responsible for putting the report together and, and getting it all, you know, all assembled and ready to go. Uh, but then it goes into uh, a QA process with the other assessment team members. So they all check each other's work and make sure like, oh, hey, you missed this thing that, uh, you know, that we did on, on day five uh, or... Sometimes you have people who, of course, you know, one person executed the attack while the other person maybe is reading notes. Uh, so that person reads it and can, you know, provide technical details or, or make corrections as needed and so on. What comes out of this process is hopefully a, like, the team's best effort. Like, this is the report we think is ready for delivery. And that goes into QA2. Uh, and this is someone else checking the team's work. Uh, usually at SpectreOps, it's a manager. Um, but, you know, it can really just be anyone else who's not on the assessment team. Uh, and this is, this is the phase where we're looking to make sure that that report makes sense. Like, can it be followed by someone who uh, doesn't have that like team's bias of knowing everything about the assessment? Uh, so they can make sure that everything links together and flows nicely. Uh, and then QA3 is just like the final sign off. It's usually just one last quick check uh, for us. Like we always ha pass that through one of our service directors. So like for the adversary simulation that go through Jeff Dimmick. Uh, he gives like the final sign off on, on every report that goes out. Uh, you know, and that'll be like the last little check, like, oh, is there a little typo that Jeff catches or, or something like that that's evaded the other, you know, sets of eyes so that the report draft that goes out is, you know, as, as good as it can be. From when it comes to report automation, you know, I mentioned the templates and everything. Uh, there, there is a fair bit that you can do with automation to make reporting easy. Uh, but I would caution you, uh, to make sure that your reporting doesn't go so far down automation that they start to look like a computer wrote them, uh, which is often a, a trap that many teams fall into. So the goal here, much like with some of the other automation, is you want to let the humans focus on what the humans do best, like writing narratives and filling in context and making things look nice, and leave the rest to the computers. So like for one example, uh, I mentioned Ghostwriter. Another part of Ghostwriter is report generation. Uh, so Ghostwriter will actually use various libraries, and one of which being uh, Jinja 2, which if you're familiar with that for like building websites uh, or other templates, uh, you can use Jinja 2, like in this example here on this slide, uh, to build out like a word template. So like this is actually Jinja 2 code in, in a word template that gets loaded into uh, Ghostwriter. And what comes out the other side is a actual like table of all of the, in this case, points of contact names, their roles and their email addresses gets put in there from coming out of Ghostwriter's uh, project and like infrastructure tracking builds out all these tables for us. So you're not having to go and like copy and paste and format everything and drop in a table. The computer just does it for you. So again, if, let the computer do these like rote, tedious, you know, creation of tables and, uh, you know, like text replacement uh, and let the humans focus on, you know, writing the story and, you know, telling, you know, telling that narrative of the assessment. So to wrap up, the key takeaways are just, you know, make sure you're setting expectations, concrete written down expectations for the team uh, that you can point to and everyone can reference at any point in time. Uh, it's okay if they change, but make sure that that's clearly communicated out and that the expectations are always updated. Staying connected uh, and having clear and like present communications is super important. Again, like if expectations change, a scope changes, something comes up with the client or the project, you want to make sure that that's being communicated very swiftly. Uh, and also to allow people to talk about problems and, and work things out so that everyone is in sync uh, as much as possible throughout the assessment. And always assume nothing. Uh, don't assume that someone is recording something uh, so you don't have to. Don't, uh, don't assume that just because a tool is logging something, you don't have to log it. Uh, those processes can fail. So while some of what I've talked about today is, can feel redundant, 
that's on purpose. We want redundancy in these processes so that if one thing breaks down, then you have those other processes in place, uh, like a tool log uh, doesn't, doesn't work. You, the logs get corrupted, you have redundant logs and so forth. And building on that, remember that everyone is a scribe. So you, I would caution against just having like that one person you assign, like, hey, you write everything down. Everyone should write down their own kind of like little assessment journal. Keep track of their own thoughts and ideas on the assessment uh, that can then, you know, become very, very, very useful uh, later in that reporting phase. And, and of course, at the end of the assessment, whenever that might be the last, you know, Wednesday before like the Friday end or that Friday, make sure you have a good sync up prior to that reporting phase. You go through, make sure that you've cleaned everything up. Uh, go through those activity logs. Uh, make sure that you're like, hey, anything that you made a change uh, or that you, you know, put a file somewhere, that all that's reverted. And if you can't revert it because you lost access uh, or you're just not sure because that computer's offline, make sure that's getting recorded. Uh, and so you can let the client know that you're not leaving artifacts around. We all shake our head when, you know, if you find like some old pen testing artifacts left somewhere. Don't be that person leaving something behind. You know, sync up prior to reporting and make sure you're all on the same page with the narrative and you've reverted all your changes uh, and that you're able to exit that project cleanly and you know, feel really good about you know, stepping away and getting ready for reporting. And that, that concludes uh, my presentation. You know, so thank you for joining and um, I'll kick it back over to Justin while I, uh, I check out some of, the, some of the questions. Yeah, so <clears throat> if you guys have questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, uh, Chris is gonna take a real quick review and then we will answer as many as we can. Um, reminder, we, uh, we've been doing this all week. Um, I dropped the links in chat. Um, you can also check uh, the previous recordings if you follow our Twitter. Um, curious if anybody here has joined any of the other sessions um, live or, or viewed them offline. Um, if you let me know in chat, it'd be, that'd be very interesting. One of the things that we're trying to figure out um, or, or just uh, discussing internally is it's kind of the future of, of this. We, we started this because we've been, uh, you know, we've all been kind of locked indoors. <laughs> Uh, over the past week and we wanted to do something about it. Um, but we, we, uh, we've gotten a lot of, of folks that have uh, been very interested. Um, and so we're kind of looking at what do we do again um, that's similar. So uh, let us know and, and uh, uh, yeah, we're excited. Chris, whenever you're ready. Yeah, so we have, we have just a few questions here. Um, it looks like some more are coming in. So yeah, do feel free to, to add more questions as we go. So the first question we had is, um, would I consider having a client deconflict over a web portal, providing that you know we have all the logs uh, and et cetera centralized? Uh, yes, uh, I mean deconfliction over a web portal seems fine. Um, obviously, there's other considerations there as far as just like the security of that web portal and so forth. Um, but uh, assuming you already have that web portal, you've accepted that risk or or you know taken it into consideration. So yeah, uh, we do have some clients that we'll request that occasionally or you know, something kind of like it. Like they'll send us a, a form uh, that kind of says like, here's the, what we've seen and some other information that like we fill out another half of it saying like, well, that's not us or that is, and here's what happened. So they kind of have that for their records. Um, yeah. So, so doing that over a web portal does seem fine. Um, really, however you, you would like to do it. Uh, it can often depend on the incident uh, as well. Like, you know, we, we also have uh, like secure chats with some clients if they need like that real time communication. And occasionally, you know, it has come up where we've been on an assessment and at the same time, like a real security incident kicks off. Um, you know, so I've uh, had like a call at, you know, midnight uh, with, you know, from like a POC that's like, hey, I need to know if this is you. <laughs> and so sometimes, like, uh, I would say definitely be prepared for like, I need something to be conflicted now versus. You know, I can wait for someone to get to it over a web portal, but uh, you know, for general things, that's probably fine. Another question was, uh, are we typing these logs by hand? Uh, so uh, that was about, it's been at about 11.35, so I assume that was, you know, about activity logs, so yes. Uh, I mentioned, you know, the automation there that you can, uh, you know, alleviate some of the typing by like automatically filling in a timestamp uh, or having maybe like autocomplete for, a like a, a target name, but generally yes, those are being typed by hand, uh, and that's very intentional. Uh, just because you want to capture that context, 
you want the operator to be able to write down like I did this because of X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, like in the example I had there, like, hey, this was lateral movement because this looked like a jump box that might get us into this other network segment uh, to kind of add some context. Because sometimes also, if you're just looking at the activity logs after the fact and you see, uh, like take, for example, Cobalt Strike and you look at just like the targets list and you see a host in there that maybe no one recognizes, like why did we ever interact with this host? It just looks like we moved there once and then we did nothing with it. Why, did, why on earth did we do that? Uh, if you had that activity log, you might see that someone put a comment and they're like, yeah, I think this, this might be interesting for this reason. And then maybe the next note might be like, actually, yep, turned out that was just a dead end and they killed the beacon and that was the end of it. Uh, so that's really the only way you might be able to capture that information of why did we ever do this thing uh, that seemed to result in nothing. Uh, so that, that's where typing it out by hand really comes into play. Uh, so then I, another question, uh, can you share what other report automation solutions you had used before Ghostwriter and any advantages or disadvantages? Um, so obviously, uh, we're, you know, we're, I'm a little bit biased um, because I, I didn't mention it during the presentation, but uh, if you are familiar with Ghostwriter or uh, you, you might know that I am uh, one of the developers of it. So I, I'm a little bit biased. Uh, Ghostwriter is definitely a culmination of different solutions I've used in the past uh, or that, you know, we, you know, all their team members have used in the past and trying to, uh, you know, make it everything that we, we liked about the other solutions with nothing we disliked. Um, so we, there's definitely a, a fair amount of like Spectre Ops team bias uh, in Ghostwriter. Uh, but, you know, the other like reporting solutions that I've used in the past have just, um, they've been limited in certain ways. Uh, it, one, one way to answer this question would be to, to point you to like the initial blog post we put out uh, that announced Ghostwriter. Um, that one gets into a fair amount of like the why did we build this a certain way. Uh, and one thing, extensibility and future proofing uh, was a big part of it. One of the key things that I would run into at, at previous companies, and I've also just heard anecdotally from other teams, is that as they're building out automation, you know, they, especially in the InfoSec community, since a lot of us just, we're not developers, but we know enough to get into trouble. We're able to build some sort of solution that works out great, uh, you know, at that moment and solves the problem today. But then at the moment, someone says like, hey, but what if we could do this as well or add this one feature to it? you realize like, oh, I'm going to have to rewrite like 70% of this to make it do that. Uh, so making sure that whatever you have can be added to and is flexible enough to be, to be changed as like the team grows, uh, you know, cause your style guide will change, uh, you know, your report template might change. So if you have a tool that generates a certain type of report and it's all in code or something like that, you might have a pain point later when you're trying to now like rewrite a bunch of it to, to fix that. Uh, so that was definitely one of the one of the downsides of a lot of the things that I've used in the past is you end up very locked in to a particular like template or style that then you end up still using that tool because it's still faster to like generate that document and then make changes to it than to like rebuild the whole tool or build that report from scratch. Um, as, and then as far as like infrastructure management, uh, I actually never really found much of, uh, you know, in my own experience, I've never really had a very good infrastructure management tool. Like my mention of spreadsheets and using a wiki uh, is definitely from my own experience. Uh, and same thing with those downsides that I mentioned, like humans will eventually fail to update it. Uh, and it just turns into a thing where everyone is pinging each other like, hey, are you still using this domain name? Uh, what, what's going on with this cloud asset, et cetera. Uh, so having something that can kind of lay down the law a little bit and automate things. Like we, we follow the rule of if there's a domain name that's in Ghostwriter and you checked it out for a project and that project got extended maybe, and then you didn't, you know, you got Ghostwriter's notification, it was about to be released back to the pool uh, and you didn't extend that checkout, it's fair game. Um, and that I think, you know, tends to keep people honest with like, they know that they might lose their domain name or something might get screwed up if they, uh, if they aren't on it. So, uh, you know, people tend to commit to it and, and use the solution. Uh, so just making sure that that the team is able to commit to whatever solution you use uh, and that it's extensible, I think would be some of the big lessons compared to like other solutions I've used outside of Ghostwriter. 
Um, I also know there's lots of teams out there that have their own solutions. I've heard from a few of them since we released Ghost Rider of like, well, we, we, we have this thing that does this a slightly different way and so on. Um, uh, but I, I don't have much firsthand experience with those because it's just, I hear about it, but they're not like open source tools. They're just kept internal. Um, looking at the next question. So the question was regarding AD logging, um, how do you do that? Uh, you know, so for web, you can set up a proxy, but what about AD related activity? Uh, so primarily that's gonna come down to the activity log in a lot of ways. Um, if it's being done over like a C2 agent, you know, the C2 logging will at least capture the operator running the commands. But, uh, but yeah, no, definitely if you're, if you're down to, as sometimes you are, like you're actually using like 80 computers and users, like on some computer somewhere, um, or something like that, and you're making a change, maybe like using a UI that there's no way you could have automated logging for. That's that's another reason that the like human, like manually logging something is incredibly important to make sure that gets captured, uh, because that won't show up in your log files, uh, or it might not be obvious. Uh, like another example would be if you're using say PowerView, something like PowerView to change a AD object. Uh, sometimes you have to use like a custom version of PowerView uh, that doesn't have like that particular function name just because, you know, AMZ and you know, Windows Defender uh, won't like you loading that. So maybe you change up the function name. Uh, so if someone need, needs to later say like, did we ever do X? And they go and they're trying to grep through logs to see what happened. Uh, they might not be able to ever find your command because you changed up all the command parameters and function names. Uh, to you know, suit your needs at the time. So making sure it's it's being manually logged is is definitely key there for interacting with AD or or really like any system like that, like custom systems that um, like custom web applications, things like that. You might access on an assessment. Well, <clears throat> well, Chris is leading the next question. Uh, I dropped the link to Ghostwriter. Um, so when he introduced Ghostwriter, so um, uh, if you guys want to check that out as well. I have a question that I'd like to suggest. Um, sure. I, I'll fire this to you live. In what ways do you notice collaboration affected by users being muted half the time? AFK, et cetera. Do you think that it is possible to fully replace the collaborator, collaborative environment that exists in person? That is, that's a deep question. Um, yeah, it, it's something that if there's a solution for how best to like manage a remote team, like how to keep everyone in, you know, in sync with each other. Uh, someone out there is keeping it a very closely guarded secret um, because yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult to keep, um, you know, keep track of things. And, you know, yeah, if someone goes AFK, how many times can you expect someone to be like, Hey, Justin, Hey, Justin, like just to keep checking if, you know, if you're there uh, or when you get back. Um, I mean, sometimes we use video for that. Like, you know, uh, at Spectrops, we do um, try to use video chat as much as we can, just like on meetings, because we don't, we don't see each other very often. So it, it's kind of nice to be able to you know, chat with each other and actually see someone's face. Uh, so doing that can be helpful. Um, you know, if everyone's comfortable with it, turning on video chat, so you're able to actually see is that person there, much like you could see if they're actually at their desk, um, you know, like in an office. Uh, so if people are comfortable with that, doing that. Um, is is often a good way to do it, but yeah, I, I don't know if there's a really good way to actually replace uh, that sort of sense of collaboration you can have if you're like all in a conference room or like you know all around like working on a project. Uh, it's it's definitely a difficult problem. All right, so the next question was. Uh, do we have a specific channel with the uh, white cell for Swift communication apart from emails? Uh, in some cases, yes. Uh, so SpectreOps, we do occasionally have, um, I think I alluded to this a little bit in, in the last slide, uh, the, uh, we will occasionally have uh, like secure chats, um, you know, like open with them, uh, you know, like where we're actually able to do very, you know, in, in real time collaborate uh, with, you know, with those individuals. Uh, this often happens if we have like a bit more of a, what we call like defensive capability testing or we do, where we're collaborating with them much more closely to say like, okay, we're going to do X right now. And then, okay, we did it. 
what do you see? And to actually like work with them in real time to see like, all right, are you getting an alert for this? Did that alert come in like an hour later uh, and so forth? Uh, so in those cases, we, def you know, we often definitely have like some sort of real time communication with them. Uh, sometimes we also, we will go on site while it's, uh, this gets a little bit away from like the remote team idea, but occasionally we do have like on-site engagements um, where collaboration is going to be important uh, or maybe there's like really sensitive things that we're going to be doing. So they want to be able to have like us in the office with them to, to talk it over. Um, so we'll, we, you know, we're actually in the room with them for like a real time chat. Uh, but, but yes, uh, having some communication other than email can be really important. Um, by default, we, we usually give out, we have like a call tree. Um, like as the assessment lead is usually the top person on that, um, you know, like the point of contact gets their phone number and can, you know, call them up and say like, Hey, I've got a problem. Can you, can you chat with me about it? And then, you know, if like they can't, if someone can't get a hold of them, it'll go on to like, uh, you know, a manager up to like our service director. Uh, so that someone is you know, going to be able to answer their question. Um, but yeah, definitely having some kind of like other channel that's not just email can really be helpful to to facilitate that that swift deconfliction. Uh, the next one was any good any recommend uh, any recommended good tools for assessment activity logs, not for reporting. Um, one of the best ones is is really just like having a, a shared spreadsheet uh, with the team, shared spreadsheet, wiki page with the table, uh, anything that can be uh, edited by multiple people live uh, is kind of a key thing there. So you can see. Uh, you know, those updates come in live. You don't have to worry about is someone already editing this uh, and so on. Any solution that offers that uh, seems to work pretty well. Uh, one thing that uh, you do want to be aware of is just making sure that it will support like a high volume. Uh, like we actually ran into this uh, recently um, where some activity logs, the solution that we've used for a long time, uh, which is basically like a wiki page that we update, uh, actually started to have some technical issues uh, due to a, a very high volume of activity logs because of just the nature of the assessment. Uh, and, and that led to uh, like, it, it seems like some logs getting lost uh, because the solution is sort of like puked and, and we lost some information. Uh, thankfully, nothing super important, but again, like that redundancy. Um, we lost some information, but we had it elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, making sure that any solution you use uh, can be shared amongst the team. Everyone can access it. It can be updated live without like, like people stomping on each other. And uh, that, uh, you know, kind of stress test it a little bit to make sure it can, it can handle what you're going to be throwing at it. Next question was, do we capture daily standups and end of day status reports in a Kanban or similar measure to progress, uh, to measure the progress of the overall like project and staff? Uh, Yes and no. Um, so uh, the, the general standard doc operating procedure for SpectreOps teams is the daily status is, is always going to be in that like centralized repository. It'll be like in the admin folder of, of the project. And, you know, we build on it each day. It's expected that that will be completed, uh, you know, sometime very shortly after like close of execution for that day. Um, so usually like by 6 or 7 p.m., uh, at the very, you know, at the, at the latest, it'll be, it'll be up there because execution is usually during business hours, uh, you know, for, for our projects and, um, or at the very least we capture that day's, uh, activity, uh, by like, by the, you know, the close of business. And those are often shared with the client, uh, as well. So we share those with the client and when we send those out, uh, it also goes out to, to all of our like, uh, adversary simulation management team. So everyone has eyes on like how a project is going. Are there any problems, uh, you know, issues where uh, maybe like we need, we need more information that we're not getting uh, or some problem has come up with like a deconfliction, things like that, uh, that, uh, you know, everyone is aware of it. Uh, and then on, I guess more of like a higher level project management side, like the, the adversary simulation management team, we do track projects in like a Kanban board uh, where we keep track of like how execution is going um, at a bit more of a high level of just like, hey, what phase is this in? Are there any issues that we're tracking from? But those issues do come from like the daily statuses. Like, are we, what are we aware of that might be uh, an issue as this goes forward? Uh, have I used Serpico for report generation? Um, I've tried it uh, once before. Um, and I, 
I, I personally, I found it a little bit problematic. I couldn't quite get it to work the way I wanted. Uh, and I know that was uh, a few members of the SpectreOps team that have contributed to, to Ghostwriter um, have also tried to use Serpico in the past um, and kind of found it similarly, uh, like a little bit frustrating. Uh, I haven't used it in a very, very long time. Um, I, I, I recall that like in our discussions uh, around like some of the early Ghostwriter design decisions, um, like I mentioned, like the extensibility, flexibility being a key thing. Uh, I do recall someone mentioning that they found that Serpico, like once you got it working and it was like, it works exactly how we want it. It's great uh, that applying any updates or making changes often cause like, a cascading effect of problems and would require a lot more work to get it like exactly how you wanted it. Um, so it did act as at least that general idea acted as a model of like, hey, we want to be able to make changes to Ghostwriter without causing any other issues for other parts or you know other pieces of the report. Um, there are definitely uh, you know like projects like Serpico out there that work on you know report generation a bit. Uh, one thing I'll say about Ghostwriter is that we wanted to also have something more than just report generation um, being a part of it. So like it has that infrastructure management, the finding libraries. Um, the, uh, like domain, ma domain name management, uh, it tracks like who's a part of the project, uh, client information, um, nothing sensitive, uh, but you know, like our points of contact names, things like that, that would end up in the report. Uh, so that when you generate the report, it's, you know, Ghostwriter is able to put out uh, a bit more information without you having to, to like enter that into like a reporting field of like points of contact, uh, who are the Spectrops points of contact for that project all the findings uh, and et cetera. Uh, we are uh, actually just in the latest update, I uh, moved in a bit more of the direction of how Serpico does uh, template, like templating, um, has like a, a bit more of a verbose template language than Ghostwriter had for a while. Uh, but in the, late, in the latest update for Ghostwriter, we added uh, the ability to, to support templates. Um, like you saw in that screenshot a little while ago of, of like the dynamically built out table using Jinja 2, uh, which I believe is a uh, is pretty similar to to how Serpico works. Uh, that that's all the questions that uh, I have in the Q and A tab. So uh, if there's any other questions, uh, feel free to submit them. Otherwise, um, they're all answered. Justin, sounds good. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we will post the recording and the slides here shortly. Um, so look out for those and thank you for joining us uh, for those that have joined earlier sessions. Thank you for also joining those and, uh, look to uh, look to us to do something similar in the future, um, TBD on when that is and what form that takes. But, uh, clearly we have, um, uh, you guys are enjoying the content, so we'll, we'll try to do it again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. One second. I'm trying to. I, Zoom is blocking me from ending the meeting. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Have a great weekend, everyone. We're all stuck here now. <laughs>